I'm Renee Teet, and um, I'm going to be talking about advice from my podcast guests about becoming a data scientist. And my podcast is called Becoming a Data Scientist. You can go to becomingadatascientist.com, and there's links to everything there. So I'm going to actually breeze through some of the slides because I want to make sure to get through a lot, so you can always go back through the slides later. I will post them. Um, but to highlight here, I just wanted to let you know that I'm a data scientist at Helio campus, and that's new. I just became a data scientist officially with the title as of July, um, and Helio campus does data analysis on um, educational data from universities. And also, um, I host the podcast, and I also have a data science learning club that I don't teach or do anything there, but I post activities and then people in the club. Um, there are over 500 members, um, but not all of them are actively participating, but 90 of them have actually posted something. So you can always go to the Data Science Learning Club and find resources that other people are posting around the different activities. So that's kind of my background. I'm also on Twitter. I have about 9,500 followers, and so I've become kind of like a connection point. So sometimes when people have data science questions, they'll tweet me, and I'll retweet it, and then other people will answer it. <laughs> so feel free to tweet me if you have any questions. So these are the guests of my podcast, and you'll be hearing from them throughout the presentation. So I get asked this question a lot. How do I become a data scientist? And my common refrain is, it depends. It always depends. So we're going to talk today about where to start to become a data scientist, who to listen to and who not to listen to, uh, what to learn, how to learn, how to practice, and how to know when you're ready. And I will have a lot of resources, but they're going to be at the end, and they're not going to be a part of the presentation. So you can get them in the slides later, but I'm not going to talk about specific um, websites or books or much of that during the presentation. OK, so first let's talk about where to start. So a lot of people ask me, where should I start? But what they really mean is, where do I even start? <laughs> There's so much information, it's kind of overwhelming. Um, have you guys been a little bit overwhelmed by the variety of information here, even just at this conference? It's a lot, right? How many of you are brand new to data science and just kind of getting into the field? Oh good, a lot of you, all right. So again, the answer is, it depends. <laughs> So there's this path to becoming a data scientist. And in order to f figure out what path you need to take, you first need to figure out where you currently are and where you want to go. So this is from Stargate. If you guys are um, familiar with the movie, this is where James Spader is explaining what the six symbols on the Stargate mean. That, that's the, the address to where the Stargate is going to take you when you walk through it. Um, and the scientists had already figured out that, but the, figure that part out, but they wanted to know, well, what is the seventh chevron? What is this other symbol? We can't figure it out. We can't activate the Stargate. And he said, well, you need to have a starting point. That's the starting planet. And there's all kinds of discussion online about the physics of this six points and seven points. It doesn't matter. The point is that he's starting on a planet, and he, he, they needed to know their starting point in order to know where to go. So he connects the two. He plays a really good nerd, by the way. <laughs> OK, so you're going to be assessing your starting point and your path, planning out a path, and then where you're going. But both the starting point and the ending point and the path, they're all custom to you. So my husband, when I showed him that, he said, well, that looks like a Feynman path integral. <laughs> and so he started talking about there are infinite ways to go from point A to point B. I said, well, that's kind of the point, right? And then he started telling me all the physics behind it and getting into this, and uh, that's just not my thing. So that's, that's the last equation you'll see in this presentation. <laughs> but he was right. There are infinite number of ways. So to figure out where you're starting from, you need to kind of assess where you are. And we'll talk about the different categories of topics to learn in data science. But you need to think about things like, how much math have you taken? When you last took math, how comfortable were you with it? Um, have you ever programmed? In what language? And how advanced were you the last time you programmed? Have you ever done basic data analysis on a professional level before? And in what domain? So there are all these baseline questions that you need to ask to figure out where you're starting from. And there's this book called Doing Data Science by Kathy O'Neill and Rachel Shutt. And it gives a good overview of just the different categories of things that you need to know. And it points you at different resources throughout. And it's based on um, a course that was taught. And they, they went through these different categories of the, the people that came in to speak to the classroom. Uh, what kind of skills did they have? But what was cool is they had this, this profile in the book where they would show 
each data scientist only has a subset of these skills and nobody's an expert at everything, right? And so the cool thing now is that companies are creating teams where they're putting together data scientists with different skill sets so that they can create a team with the skill set that they need. So you have to think about what kind of data scientist do you want to be? You're not going to be an expert in everything. Um, there's different titles that kind of go along with data scientists or that are now called data scientists that weren't before. So if you really love solving business problems with data and working with people and being kind of customer facing, um, a lot of those roles are called data analyst. That's kind of the area that I'm in. Um, but also now data scientist when you add on machine learning and some other techniques. If you really like working with the code and working in the back end and the big data systems, you might gravitate towards more of a data engineer, a big data engineer. But if you really like doing the research and more of the academic side, you could do something like a machine learning researcher and develop new machine learning algorithms. You could be a statistician looking at certain domains of data, but you can also call yourself a data scientist. So there's overlap here. And here's a lot of the different titles that now call themselves data scientists. So you can see there's all kinds of different domains and fields. And I think that this is what's exciting about being a data scientist now is that there are really a lot of different ways to go with it, and you can apply data science techniques to just about any area. So I find that exciting that you're not boxed in. And so to figure out what kind of data scientist you want to be, you want to find somebody that can be a role model, somebody that's kind of doing what you eventually want to do, and you can talk to them or you know watch my podcast. I try to interview a variety of people and find out what is it they do day to day and how did they get there. You can look at job listings online to figure out what to do, what to learn, but be aware that that's kind of problematic. Some of the job listings, they the companies don't really know what they're looking for or they don't really know what a data scientist is, so they just list everything in the <laughs> listing. So if there's a job listing that has like way too many things, just be aware you don't have to know all those things to get a job like that. They're probably just listing their whole wish list and, and um, hoping that they get somebody with a subset of that. Um, but job listings can be a good way to figure out um, the different types of data scientists and the expectations. Ask data scientists you meet, like at conferences or online. And I said join the conversation on Twitter because I found that there's a really good data science community on Twitter. Um, like I said, I have like 9,500 followers. Um, it's, there are a lot of people learning data science and a lot of people that are already data scientists sharing what they do. Um, and also, there's a lot of women in data science on Twitter, which is what I like. I have a list um, I've been compiling, and if you want to be on the list and you're not on it, let me know. But I have over 800 women in data science on my Twitter list so far. So when you're planning out your path, you want to keep it pretty general, but know the waypoints along the way. So if I wanted to go from where I live in Harrisonburg, Virginia, up to Boston, I want to know, I definitely want to go through DC and see the monuments, but I, I don't want to plot out exactly the path. I just want to know the specific points. And then my GPS is going to tell me along the way, well, okay, you're going to go through DC. And so I'll say, great, I can stop and see all the monuments in DC. But then when I'm getting close, I found out, oh, beltway traffic. You know, the monuments aren't that important. I'm trying to get to Boston. <laughs> so just be ready to kind of reroute and figure out, um, th basically, as you go, you're going to find different things that you need to learn, gaps you need to fill in in order to get where you're going. And the things that you initially thought you might need to learn might change along the way. So that's okay. You don't have to plot out every single point. This is Trey Causey, one of my podcast guests. And so when I was talking to him about all these things to learn, um, his advice was that Part of being a data scientist is being okay with not understanding everything. You're going to be doing yourself a disservice if you set out to learn all of the different topics that people say that you should learn. You're going to ask 10 people and get 12 answers. <laughs> And Stephanie said, it's going to be your job for the rest of your life. So if you're going to get really good at something, make sure it's something you enjoy, because it requires a lot of persistence and curiosity to be happy and successful. So don't force yourself into something. Follow what you enjoy. So in other words, with all this variety of things you can learn under the umbrella of data science, you can just pick what you like. You don't have to learn everything that you don't like, and you'll still be valuable. So this is your chance to become a candidate for your dream job and decide what you want to learn and then make it fun. It doesn't have to be like school and it doesn't have to be somebody else's program. Okay, my timer just reset, so can somebody give me a 10 minute heads up? <laughs> okay. So once you have an idea about this possible path, who do you turn to for guidance? So we're gonna talk about who to listen to and who not to listen to. So when you're getting on a ride, you ha might have the sign that says, you have to be this tall to ride, right? There's like a gatekeeper there. 
But there's people like that in tech too. They'll say, to be a real data scientist, you have to be a PhD. You have to be a computer scientist. You gotta be from a top school. We only hire people from Stanford. <laughs> you have to be traditionally educated, right? None of that's true. I mean, you'll meet data scientists with all different kinds of backgrounds. So what they're really saying is you have to be just like me and the people that I know, because I got here. And they're, they're pattern matching to their own experience and, and they're, they're limiting the kind of people they can hire. So you don't want to listen to people like that. And what they'll say, if they're honest, is like Isaac Newton said, I've seen further by standing on the shoulders of giants. So the ones that you do want to listen to are the people that will say, hey, here are the resources that helped me. Here's how I got to where I am. They're not trying to block you and they're not making assumptions about you. They're just saying, here's how I got here and trying to help you get there. So who not to listen to? The gatekeepers, like I said, you have to be a certain thing. The naysayers. You just aren't cut out to be a data scientist. Or in the past, like, you failed math. What are you even thinking? You sure don't look like a data scientist. <laughs> so you guys might remember um, the Twitter um, campaign that was hashtag, I look like an engineer. And that came from this um, ad in the subway where I think her name is Isis Anchali. And um, somebody put online, they said, you know, she doesn't look like an engineer. They probably just hired some model to try to attract men. <laughs> And so, so she went and said, yes, I am. She started the hashtag, I look like an engineer. I help build enterprise software. I'm an engineer, right? So don't listen to those people. And then there's the scoffers. They'll be like, oh, it's so easy. If, if you're not getting this, you're just not cut out for it, right? Do you guys know about Nick Burns, the, your company computer guy on SNL? He comes into the office and people are saying, oh, I, have, I have a tech problem. I don't know what to do with my computer's frozen. And he'll say, well, did you try this, 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 and this? And I'm like, I don't even know what those things are. And he'll say, move. <laughs> and he just wants to take their place. Like, forget it. You don't understand. I'll do it for you. Don't listen to those people if you're trying to learn. And then your own doubts, right? So sometimes you're the one telling yourself that if I'm already struggling, I just shouldn't be in this field. Like, uh, it turns out that a lot of women will drop out of computer science if they aren't getting A's in their introductory class. Um, but it turns out that a lot of men will stay in the program if they're getting A's, B's, C's, whatever. They figure, okay, I'll figure it out as I go along. So don't count yourself out too early. So who do you listen to? Like I said earlier, the honest and helpful people who have been there. They say, oh, I got stuck there too. Here's, here are the, my resources. Your supporters, they're saying, oh, you're so awesome at that one thing. You know, that, that thing, you've got it down. Keep going. I can't wait to do, see you do this next project that you're working on. And you want to listen to experts that know how to teach beginners, so good teachers. Sometimes people are experts, but they forget what it was like to be a beginner, and they can't communicate, right? But you want to listen to people that say, well, let's walk through this. I'll show you how it works. And then your confidence self, like, I can do this. I just need more resources. I just need another book. I just need someone to explain this one concept to me. So for guidance, find people that are the type of data scientists that you want to become, good teachers that know how to communicate with beginners. Other beginners are also good resources. You know, other people that maybe are just ahead of you on the learning path, and they could tell you, well, that thing caught me up, or I, that course really didn't help me. And then mentors and friends who share your passion are in the domain you want to work. So if you want to find a mentor, find somebody with the same interests as you so that you can kind of follow along with them and they understand what you're trying to get at. So I'll tell you, data science is not easy. I've struggled with it a lot. It's not even very well defined. So if nobody knows what data science is, how can you say it's easy? It's also not too hard for you. Like a part of it might be hard for you right now, but you're going to get there. So you just have to find the right resources and stick with it. And it's up to you not to get derailed, because this isn't like school where they're just going to pass you to the next level and you'll graduate. You're the one determining what you learn, how far you go. So we'll talk a little more about how to learn in part five. First, let's say what to learn. So what do I need to learn to be a data scientist? You know the answer, it depends. So I don't want to go into details here, but this is just some example of data scientist careers and the different skill sets. But the concept I'm trying to get across is that you need these four categories no matter what area of data science you go into. So math and statistics, computer science and machine learning, data visualization and communication, and business domain knowledge. And I put business in quotes because it doesn't mean business like marketing. It's just like the domain that you're going into. It could be a research science. But you'll see all, the, all of them are check marks. There's none that are missing. But some of the check marks are bigger. So for instance, if you want to be a machine learning developer, you better understand computer science and the statistics behind it. 
So first you learn the basics. And there's kind of a joke in data science because there's a lot of Venn diagrams out there about what data science is. But this one has mathematics, computer science, and domain expertise. And you can see what's in the different intersections there. And then in the middle, that's data science. So I have a list of what I think are the bare minimums that you need to learn. Um, first is undergraduate level descriptive statistics. Obviously, you can go a lot further with statistics if you want to, but at least like a, a undergraduate level intro course is a minimum. You also want to know how to visualize data, how to make a good chart that can communicate things. On the computer science side, you have to at least be able to code to manipulate data and summarize the, the information in one language, like Python. And then you want to at least be able to run some of the packaged machine learning techniques. So you might not understand the calculus and statistics and uh, algorithms behind the scenes, but you know how to apply them and generally what they mean and how to test to see if the results were good. And then the domain knowledge. Um, you, you should have an area that you, if you want to go into a specific area, you should at least be able to do like a simple business intelligence type of report, which is you know a summary of a spreadsheet type of thing, maybe even Excel. Um, and then be able to communicate your understanding of that information to different people in the in the domain and understand the terminology. So that's kind of the minimum baseline when you get in. But then you also need to become a specialist in some area. And you can pick what that area is. So it might be something like machine learning and AI. So you might learn more about deep learning, autonomous sy systems, computer vision, natural language processing. You might learn how to make really pretty data visualizations, like for publication, be a data journalist. You could focus on the big data engineering side and work on things like Hadoop, Spark. Um, you might go into the geographic data and mapping techniques and work on a GIS system. Or it might be that the domain is your specialty, like you come from a specific research science background, or you want to focus on educational data or politics or marketing. So maybe the domain becomes your expertise. Claire Corthell has an online open source data science master's program that she outlined all the different things that she learned while she was um, going through learning data science. And I asked her, should, I, should somebody go through this whole list if they want to be a data scientist? And she said, absolutely not. You should cherry pick and be very strict about what you include because you could spend your whole life on one of these topics that's under the umbrella of data science. So find a niche within that area and get good at that one thing. Experts are usually experts at one thing. This is Safia. She said, it's dangerous ideology, the notion of a super genius. So some of us just imagine that there's these people out there that are good at everything. They're just data science geniuses. And you know they're not, and that's dangerous because it makes you feel like you can never get there. But they got there by learning and practicing and focusing on a certain area and um, you know making sure they get, got good at it. So. Um, the idea of a super genius is, is, she's right, that's a dangerous notion. And then Justin says, get experience. A lot of the data science skills I've developed are out of interest. If I have a problem that's in front of me, I'll figure out what I need to learn to solve that problem. So he started in music and then became a neuroscientist and now he's in a data scientist as well. And he just figured it out as he went along. I mean, he's also a PhD, so he got a lot of academic background. But I heard this again and again from different um, guests on the podcast that I just had a project I wanted to do, and so I figured out what I need to learn next to do the next step of that project. If you're a total beginner, I recommend start by creating a report. So this might just be finding a data set online in an area you're interested in, summarizing in an Excel, make some charts, make sure you can explain what's going on there. Um, so a basic data analysis that answers a business question. And like I said, business doesn't have to be like marketing. Um, it could be any domain. So I consider this to be the baseline for anyone that calls himself a data analyst or a data scientist. You should be able to take a business question, like somebody asks you something and says, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to optimize, or I'm not trying to figure this out, and understand that question enough to turn it into a data question and say, here's the data that you need to answer that question. Here's how we can find that data. And then be able to do the answer. Here's how we can analyze that data, right? Here's the summary. And then turn it back into a business answer. So you don't want to give that person like some statistical result of how well your model fit the data. You want to be able to turn it back into here's what it means. So don't just focus on the technical tools and techniques that you need to learn. The non-technical skills are just as important. And this kept coming up in the interviews. So Sherman, he's in marketing analysis, and he does some data science himself and hires data scientists. So he said, the number one thing that I look for is curiosity. The value added is by saying, I found this, and I'm curious, how did that happen? And taking the analysis to another level. 
So the soft skills that came up often in the interviews were things like curiosity, the ability to communicate with a variety of people, the ability to hear the problem. So a lot of times people will like assign you a, a problem and say, do this analysis. But you need to understand what is it they're really trying to get at. So you're not just doing like answering a question. You're trying to understand what is their real question behind that. The desire to continue to learn, you're going to be learning on the job. Um, creativity for problem solving. Tenacity. Um, Enda Ridge, he's the author of Guerrilla Analytics, and he has a list in that book of things that he expects data analysts to have, um, the skill set. But he said that a critical part of the data scientist mindset is tenacity. You've got to be able to keep going at a problem, right, and get it, overcome it. And um, Dr. Shlomo Argaman, he's a professor at IIT. He's the director of the Masters of Data Science program there. I asked him, so what are the common traits of your most successful students? And he talked about being able to overcome unexpected difficulties. So if there's some weird row of data, you know, you don't just give up and come into class the next day and say, well, I got stuck. You know, I need your help. But to be able to figure out what is it about that row of data? Why am I getting stuck? What does this error mean? And then I add recognition of wider issues that come into play. Um, for instance, bias that could be introduced in a machine learning algorithm. So thinking of the bigger system and what kind of impact your analysis is going to have. So I made another data science Venn diagram. You're welcome. <laughs> and um, the, the combination here, oh, I want to also say that Steph De Silva helped me with this on Twitter. So I tweeted an early sketch of what I was thinking, and, and she filled in a lot of the gaps here. So the common themes, like I just talked about, folk kind of center around curiosity, creative problem solving, and communication. So those are the three circles there. But what are the overlaps? So if you take out curiosity, you've got creative problem solving and communication. So a person with these two skills, they can answer the questions that are asked and communicate that answer, but they're not doing that value add that Sherman was talking about. They're not going beyond and trying to answer the, the real question that's being asked and diving in deeper about why. Without creative problem solving, you might be curious and be able to communicate, so you do some great research, you really define the problem well, you can talk to the people asking the question, but you're not offering them any actionable solutions, like, well, what can I really do with this result? Then if you have the creative problem solving and the curiosity, you might have a perfect data science analysis, but if you can't communicate that to the end user, then it's just an un unintelligible presentation of otherwise good results, and that's useless. They don't know what you're talking about. So at the intersection is good data science practice. And these three things were mentioned consistently by the guests as either traits that they themselves had or things that they look for when they're hiring a data scientist or things that set people apart. There are a lot of people that know the technical side that don't have this non-technical side and that's really what can set you apart in an, inter in an interview. So now we have this list of technical and non-technical things to learn. So now how do you go about learning it? It depends. So you want to choose resources that work with your learning style and customize it. So a lot of people always ask me, you know, what's the best thing you use to learn data science? Well, that might not necessarily help you. So I have a list of resources at the end, but it's a long list because you might like videos, you might like books more, you might like the interactive coding sites more. So there are a lot of different resources out there. It's a little bit overwhelming, which is why I started a website called Data Sci Guide that I can talk about afterwards if you're interested. But the idea is to um, have people in data science at different skill levels rate whether the resource was helpful for them at that time. But you have to customize it to your learning style. And you have to overcome your math and programming aversions. So I came out of high school, I went to a science and technology school, but I went into college saying, I don't want to take any more math than I have to, and I hope I never have to program again, because I hated it in high school. But then it turned out that the program I was in at James Madison University, um, it was integrated science and technology, and we had to take kind of baseline um, courses and everything, and the, the programming class that I had to take there was totally different, and it was focused on like building an interface and solving a real world problem and not just you know solving a math problem. And so that got me interested again. So you don't have to love math and programming, but you have to not hate them in order to learn them. And there's this really great TED talk with Sal Khan from Khan Academy, and he talks about let's not teach for mastery, I mean let's teach for mastery, not test scores. And so his, his idea is that the way school has traditionally worked is that you teach a whole class, you're bringing them all along together, and you might have students that get, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent, but you, you pass them to the next level and you say, well, you got an 80, that's good enough, we're moving on, uh, class can't wait for everybody. And then you've got these people in class that are missing 20 percent of the foundation 
foundational information they need before they move on. Then they start feeling lost and then you start hating it, right? So that's why a lot of people hate math and programming because they got lost at some point and felt stupid. So the point is that you can try it a different way now. And his point in the talk was that we now have systems that can customize that learning per student. We don't have to bring them all along as the same class. But when you're teaching yourself, you can keep going at it until you feel like you've mastered that. You can keep asking until you understand something. So there's not that pressure and you can, you can do it yourself and use a lot of different resources, right? I don't know if you, many of you guys ever played the old school game called Lemmings. Um, if you haven't, maybe you're more familiar with Angry Birds, but these are puzzle games where you have to keep going at something and figure out something and repeat the level over and over until you get it and then you finally solved it and what do you get next? A harder level. <laughs> So people that like this kind of game that have the patience and persistence and problem solving skills to, to play them, if you have that en enough to play and move forward in the game, you probably have the same skills you need to program that game. So those are the, that's the same kind of concepts you go through when you're coding. So now that you know what to learn, how do you practice it, right? You've learned it, you know what to learn, you know how to learn it, but now what do you do to put it in real world context? The most common advice that I keep hearing is to start a project related to something that matters to you. And I really recommend this as well. So you want to find a real world data set. There's lots of free data sets online. Um, if you need help finding one, I have a lot of links that can help. Um, or you can generate your own data. Um, one of the Data Science Learning Club members, Verena, she put um, GPS collars on her cats and tracked them walking around her neighborhood. <laughs> or you can track um, you know, information from like a Fitbit about yourself. Find something that matters to you and then ask questions that could be answered by that data set. And then each step of your project means you're going to learn a new topic or a new skill or technique. And then I also recommend blogging about your experiences and sharing it. I think that's kind of why my blog and podcast um, took off without it being you know, super polished is just because I would share it as I went along. I wouldn't wait until I had some final version that was ready to present. People liked seeing me struggle because they're going through the same thing and that's what's helpful to them. So share it. And if you don't want to write on a blog, then record yourself talking about it or something. You have to make sure you're getting feedback that you're doing doing it right. Of course, there will always be people that will tell you you're doing it wrong no matter what, <laughs> but at least you can um, get some of that feedback. And then also whether you're communicating the results well. So Will said, my answer is to always read a lot of books and study every night when people ask him about learning data science. And then they ask him, well, how else? <laughs> no one likes that answer. That it's just consistent, repeated practice and learning. And then Sebastian had a good metaphor. He said, how I learn best is really by struggling. If you're lifting weights and you only lift the small weights, you'll never become any stronger. And there's also the converse of that. If you just try to lift a giant weight, you're going to hurt yourself and not want to lift weights anymore, right? So it's definitely a process and you want to move yourself along. I'm reading this book right now called Peak Secrets from the New Data Sciences, uh, new si data, from the New Science of Expertise. And they have this concept called deliberate practice, which is based on a lot of real research. And their point is that um, inherent talent doesn't determine who becomes an expert. And also, there's really no such thing as inherent talent. Um, a lot of people that seem to be good at things as kids often just started earlier and have done it more often. Um, but also, somebody that practices something every day, and this is the research that that 10,000 hour rule came out of, which turns out not to be totally um, applicable to everything. Um, it was a specific part of the research, but it's the concept of if you spend something like 10,000 hours on a topic, um, you're going to get better. But they wanted to make the point it's not just spending time on the topic. It's this deliberate practice of pushing just beyond where you are. So if you just go out and play tennis every day, you can play every single day for your whole life, but you might not get better. You have to have a specific technique that you want to get better at, practicing a specific skill, having feedback and guidance from a teacher that can tell you, well, you're holding the racket a little bit wrong here. And a specific goal, if you want to get better at serving, you're going to do practice a little differently than if you want to get better at you know, making sure you return the ball. So this is a good book if you want to learn about becoming an expert. So then how do you know when you're ready to take the next career step or apply for a job? It's not going to be like in the matrix where you have a plug in the back of your hand and you say, whoa, I know data science. <laughs> 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 it's, 
It doesn't feel like that. You you actually, Will made the comment in the podcast, he's episode one, and I think that's a really good um, episode, that you kind of always feel dumb when you're in data science because there's always something else to learn. It's always the next thing, right? And Aaron said, I think that people overestimate what you need to know to get started in this field. So you can be a junior level and you can apply for jobs and just let people know like, here's what I know, I'm just starting out, here are my skills, I think I can help you, but also I can learn on the job from your existing data scientists. And I personally felt ready when I knew I had those foundational skills. Um, I was comfortable with the terminology, so when I talked to, to people about data science, I wasn't totally lost. Um, I had accomplished a few difficult things, and that made me realize, well, if I can get through these several difficult things in a row, then I can learn anything else on the job. Like, I've got the foundation, I've gotten from end to end on a few different projects, I'm ready. And then there's nothing wrong with doing a few stretch interviews for practice. So you can apply for a job when you're not quite ready and you'll get the feedback of, um, you know, what type of things were they looking for, where were your gaps. And it is hard to apply for jobs and be rejected a lot and data science is a competitive field, but there are a lot of jobs out there. So you might have to go on several interviews um, before you get one, but you're going to find one that's a good match for you. But there's nothing wrong with trying them just for practice and see how far you go. You might get hired anyway. So in summary, you probably learned today, it depends. <laughs> That's always going to be my answer. But what that means is that you have to customize the advice that you get. So hopefully I've given you some guidance on how to do that and how to get started on the path to your data science dream job. So here's what we talked about. Figure out where you're starting from and what kind of data scientist you want to be and map out that path, but not too specifically. Learn those required baseline topics descriptive statistics, coding enough to manipulate and summarize, simple machine learning, and a solid analytical understanding in some domain. Get good at a specific niche beyond the basics. Deliberately practice those technical skills and soft skills with real world data, and don't forget to get feedback. And then you're never going to be done learning, so don't wait too long to try applying for a data science related job. You're going to have to just go for it. And most importantly, have fun while you're doing it. It's hard, it won't feel fun while you're in it, <laughs> but then when you finish something and you're getting it working, it, it's really fun, it's exciting. Um, Debbie Barabiches was one of my podcast guests, and she's a physicist and the chief data scientist at Metis. And when I asked her, you know, what's your bottom line advice to data science learners or people like you and how you started out? And she didn't say, you know, take a data science boot camp, even though she works at Metis. She said, what's most important is to not let anyone take your dreams away, to know that they're there for a reason, and you have them because they're part of your essence. And if you choose not to listen to that voice that's telling you, one day you're going to pay for it and be unhappy. So pursue your dreams no matter how hard you think they are in the moment and find a mentor. So I think that's a good summary of everything I've been trying to say. So questions? Yes. So the job's about um, actionable solutions. Mm -hmm. I found that a challenge. Okay. So like the analytics I get, you know, um, but actually making suggestions of what people should do. So can you give some examples? Okay, so the question was the actionable solutions part. Um, once you do the analysis and hand it over, how do you get to that point where you can uh, make suggestions for what to do? So in order to do that, that's why you need the domain knowledge. So you really understand what's being asked and what they're trying to get at. So you might not be able to give a business suggestion um, because that's not your expertise, but knowing what they're asking, you should be able to give some guidance within that question. So you can say, um, you know, your question was this, and here's the wide range of possibilities, and I'm seeing that this particular possibility is probably the most likely to get you where you want to go. So, you know, I'm not going to say it in statistical terms, but, you know, you could see a certain chart maybe, and, you know, this section shows that this is where you should focus. So it could be something like that, where you're not, you're not telling them what to do as a business, but you're telling them, based on the analysis, here it is in your terms so that you can take it and move forward with it. Other questions? Uh -huh. And also at the same time, you mentioned that you need to be a fast learner so that you can pick up new things on uh -huh. quickly. So how do you balance those two things? Because you know, if you want, if you go into a niche, it means like you're 
I don't want to learn this stuff. You're boxing yourself then. Okay, so the question is about how do you balance out between learning things that are in a certain niche and then learning the wide variety of things since you're supposed to be a fast learner and picking things up without boxing yourself in. So the niche I was talking about was for something that you want to do and become good at as an expert and you still need that baseline across everything. So um, once you have that baseline and you know that you can pick up anything, you're aware that if you spent enough time and enough practice, you could pick up any other area. But the niche is where you want to focus. So it's not that you're boxing yourself in from learning anything else, but it's that first you have to get solid footing in something to be able to say, hey, this is the type of data scientist I am. So um, I would say once you have those baselines and you spend a lot of time in your niche and that's where you do your projects and you make sure that everything's kind of centered around that, like if your niche is data visualization, you could do a lot of different kind of projects, but you make sure that each time you spend extra time on that data visualization. So you're not stopping yourself from learning something else, but you're getting especially good at that one thing. I hope that answers it. Okay. Yes. So you mentioned like find a mentor. Uh huh. So is that like uh, join a community or something? Because we don't do any data science in the current team that I work in. Okay, so finding a mentor, right? Sometimes it could be somebody on your current team that you're like kind of apprenticing under. Um, sometimes it could just be somebody in the field. Like maybe if you're a physicist, you might look at what Debbie did and how she got, went from physics to becoming a data scientist. Um, so it might not be a mentor that you're actually like talking to one-on-one -on -one necessarily, though that's, it's good to have somebody like that. It could just be somebody that you look up to and you study how they got to where they are. And then sometimes they're accessible. Like Debbie will answer tweets on Twitter. So once you kind of figure out, well, here's how she got and here's where I'm stuck, maybe I'll ask her that specific question. So it's not that you need someone that you can call up all the time and like personally guide you through, but somebody that is going or is already at where you're going and, and someone that you can follow. Um, and I think probably the domain is more important than the specific techniques if you're, when you're looking for a mentor. Like you don't have to necessarily find someone that has the same technical niche that you're going for, but is in the same domain. So you can talk to them about the type of problems that need to get solved and am I positioning myself to be valuable in this industry. So it's not maybe not the traditional um, description of a mentor, but um, there's kind of that whole range from like someone you're actually working with side by side all the way to just somebody that's a really good role model, but that's willing to share information. Yeah. So the question was about the balance between theory and practice. So because of the variety of people coming into data science, I find that some people come from more of like an academic research theory background and they feel like I have to know all the theory before I can get into the practice. You don't want to restrict yourself from getting to applying it, like actually doing the projects is good. Um, but then there's people on the other side that just say, I want to apply this black box algorithm, apply everything and get an output, but I don't really care what it means inside. You don't want to be on that side either. So it is a balance. Um, I would say that you would want to make sure to understand the theory, at least within the niche of what you're doing, of why that specific area, what are the theories behind what you're learning in that area. So you make sure that the area that you're saying that you're more expert in, that you do understand those theories. Um, with machine learning algorithms, you're saying you want to study how each of them learn works. Um, if there's a certain one that you find yourself using repeatedly or that comes up a lot in the industry that you're in, I would say make sure you fully understand behind the scenes how that one works. And that will give you a concept of how machine learning in general works. Um, you know, understanding the math behind it, the computer programming behind it, maybe diving into, you know, a lot of the, the um, packages are open source, so you can actually look at the code behind them and how it works. And studying one very thoroughly, that will give you probably enough footing to be able to translate that and understand something else or talk to somebody that has worked with something else without having to go through that entire process for every single alg algorithm you might apply. So it is a balance, I would say, y you need at least enough theory in the area that you're focusing on, um, but the practical part is really important. Uh, companies care about what can you do for me, but they also care do you understand what you're doing, <laughs> but they don't want you to be so hung up in the theory that you're never getting anything done. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, just evaporate. <laughs> 
Yeah, so it looks like you're almost implying that you can just self-learn your way into data science. Uh -huh. um, but like, like you mentioned, like you, need, you need to have some understanding of what you're doing. And I don't know, like, from the other side, it, like some people will say, hey, you, well, you got to do your traditional uh, statistics courses, you know, take mm -hmm. you know, up to like graduate level courses. Yeah. So because maybe that's the only way where to force you to understand all these issues that could come up. Okay, uh, so if you just did it, you know, by self-learning, you may not just be aware that it exists. So he's saying that, that yeah, he's saying that the dangers of teaching yourself everything is that you might know, you might not know what type of things to be aware of or what type of things um, an expert that's teaching a course would inform you of, right? So um, even though it's self-learning, a lot of the, the guides will cover some of that stuff. So a lot of the books that you'll use to learn or the courses you'll learn online will cover that. Um, you can take, especially in the foundational courses, if you feel like you need a class, um, you can go to a community college and take a statistics course if you don't feel comfortable with the ones online. Though a lot of courses online now really cover end to end. They have the entire curriculum that they would teach in the college course. So it's kind of a balance. You know, If you don't want to pay for a degree, um, you can probably find some open version of an actual course from a university. Um, but uh, the other thing is about what I mentioned about getting feedback and finding people in the industry that know what they're talking about. So when you post information online, you can ask, you can say to somebody, you know, am I thinking about this right? Uh, or I, I got this weird result. What is it that I'm missing? Um, so you can definitely dive in deeper in some areas and ask people that would be teaching those courses. So like I personally, um, I did a master's degree long after my bachelor's degree um, in systems engineering, which has some overlap with data science. But it had been a long time since I did a lot of that math. I was struggling struggling with it. Um, but also, I'm really glad that I took a machine learning course that focused on the math behind the machine learning. And it was really hard for me, but that really gave me a footing that I probably wouldn't have sought out myself with, with self-learning. So that's an area where, you know, if I were just going straight from being a, a SQL data analyst and database designer, which was my background, trying to become a data scientist, I might seek out a professional course in machine learning. Um, but that same information was also in the textbook that we were using in the course. So. Well, and that depends on the job. I got a job as a data scientist and did not have to do anything from the elements of statistical learning book. <laughs> it, they didn't give me a test like that. Um, so it, it really depends and certain certain jobs are going to expect a statistician. I. I interviewed for a job and that w I told them ahead of time that was before I was you know felt like I was fully at the point where I'm I can dive in and actually even when I got the job that I got I didn't feel like I was fully ready <laughs> but I was ready enough for that specific job which was kind of a data analyst slash data scientist so um, I could kind of grow into the data science role um, so if if you're not fully comfortable in that area you know don't apply for a job where they're going to give you a statistics test <laughs> to, to get the job but yes, you, you do need the foundation know, like and there are resources. I'm having a conversation now. I, think, I feel like with, with more formalization of data science, you know, this interview process will be become more strict and will be, there's like be more hurdles for you to overcome, including even having the actual official degree. Well, and that, that may become true with more universities having a data science degree. Um, however, I've found, at least in the early years of universities suddenly jumping into data science, they're rebranding another program. So it might be like a statistics program and they bring in a computer science professor and say, we now have a data science program. <laughs> but yes, I mean, you're right. There, there are some things that you really need the technical foundation. And it's worth taking a course if you feel like that's a big gap for you. But you don't have to take a whole degree program to do that. Yeah. Yeah, so there's resources at the end of the presentation, but I'm not going to run through all them here. I'll share the slide presentation. So look for my slides. Um, you can go to becomingadatascientist.com. It's not up there yet, but I'll share the slides there and a blog post. And I have a lot of lists, but they're not even linked to anything. So that way you'll have the links and you won't have to go look everything up. <laughs> all right. Well, I think I'll wrap up here. If anyone has more questions, you can come see me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.